Welcome back to our online Bible study. We're looking at Thy Kingdom Come and the subtitle Advancing the Kingdom of God. And what does that mean? How do we advance the kingdom of God? We've been talking about how important it is that we not disengage ourselves from the world around us. We are in the world. We're not of the world. But we're here for a purpose. We're here for a mission. God has given us an assignment. As we talked about before, that he told us to go and make disciples of all nations. Why? Because there will be nations, even as we saw looking into the millennial reign, that there will be nations and that that the Lord will separate the sheep from the goats. We also saw that in the new heaven and the new earth, in the holy city, that there would be nations that would be coming to bring their glory into the city of Jerusalem. Just like people went to see Solomon and they brought a caravan, a, an entourage with them bearing gifts showing what <clears throat> the greatness of their king their uh kingdom or where they came from they were bringing their wealth to solomon to show just like the queen of sheba she brought many many valuable gifts to king solomon so they were bringing the glory of their nations to Jerusalem to King Solomon. The same will be true when Jesus sits on his throne to rule and reign this earth. He is the of the lineage of the of David and he is the Mashiach. He is the one that we have been looking for that people have been looking for for a long time. Of course we as believers we have accepted him as the Messiah. But our job is to bring, as Jesus told us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. We're on this earth, even as it is in heaven. So we need to be doing our job. Now, as we left off last time, we were talking about how Lance Wall now developed this concept many years ago as he became a business and governmental uh, consultant that he realized you know he started out uh, he was in business and then he left business to become a pastor and he pastored I think for 20 years and then he realized that what God was calling him to do was in the secular world that his mission field was in business and politics and that he was to go and to influence those in those positions. And so he developed this concept as God began to reveal this to him that there are seven spears or seven mountains of culture that impacts and influences a nation. And we said the very center, the very heart of all of this is the family. As goes the family, so goes the nation. And we know that our families are so dysfunctional in many cases. We talked about how even in those who call themselves Christians, that they're living a lifestyle that is, does not line up with what the Bible talks about that there is abuse, that there is sexual, uh, physical, emotional, verbal abuse in the homes, that many homes only have one parent, if they have any. And so there has been a breakdown of the family, but also the family has been influenced by these other six spears or six mountains in our culture that has had a, a huge impact on our family and of course the enemy knows that 
That's been his strategy. You got to break down the family because that is the most important unit in the society. But to do that, you have to break down all these other areas in education. Get them away from the Bible. Don't let them bring a Bible to school. Don't let them read or pray in the public schools. Even though the schools were originally established so people could learn how to read the Bible and how to train ministers and missionaries, etc., to change our culture. But then the enemy came in and began to tear that down. And now even the textbooks are not, are, do not want to reference anything concerning what the Bible has to say. We know what government looks like now. It's, it's many cases, it's the swamp. You know, there is so many, um, well, I don't know what the percentage is, but the ones that are vocal, the ones that you see on the media are definitely opposed to the family unit. They approve abortion. They want immigration, unlimited uh, immigration because they want people in here that will vote for them. They'll promise them anything if they'll just vote for them. And they spend the governmental money, the federal government's money, in order to stay in power because they make promises to people. And then you bring in elements into your society that are not assimilated into your culture, do not want to be a part of your culture. And some of them are, a certain percentage of them are felons. They're criminals. So what does that do to your society? And we see what media is doing now, how it's blasting anything that has to do with God. We know that religion has veer, is veering off course in many denominations, they're adopting and embracing lifestyles and ideology that does not line up with the scripture. And yes, we're to love our enemies, we're to love one another, that we are to be compassionate, but we're also to speak the truth in love, that we're to reach out and we are to help people to get back on course if they're on the wrong course. We know in business that there's been greed. Think about the pharmaceutical companies. Do they really want people well or are they in it just for the billions of dollars that they're making off of the American public? Arts and entertainment, you know, we've talked about that before and how uh, you know, many of the, even the um, amusement parks or things like Disney started out with fun and with wholesome uh, programming. But then what has happened? It's been a slippery slide down into witchcraft, sorcery, perversion, lifestyles that we wouldn't want our children to be involved in, uh, and profanity, and ungodliness, violence. So it goes into video games, into our amusement parks, it goes into our movies, our television programs, etc. So if we're going to change America, and if we want to make America great, we need to have an impact on all of these mountains of culture. The same is true for the kingdom of God, if we're to have an impact for the kingdom of God. And I think that goes hand in hand because you can't make America great without God. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. So you cannot have a great society if you do not have God right in the very center or core of your nation. So it all goes hand in hand. And we need, it's our job. We're not to sit back and be silent and be politically correct. 
we have to step forward and say, what can we do to make a difference? Well, as I mentioned before, I think, is that Andrew Womack and Lance Walnow are two leaders. Andrew Womack has a uh, Bible college, Karis Bible College in Colorado, and locations throughout the world as well. Uh, the Lord spoke to him, and he has a television, radio, internet ministry that goes throughout the world. And so he has traveled in many places around the world, and he has a great uh, following of people that listens to his teachings because they're all biblically based. They're solid biblical teachings. And he and Lance have teamed up together as well as some others like Dave Barton, who if you want to know the history of our nation, if you want to know what the Constitution and the Declaration and what our founding fathers were all about, he is a walking encyclopedia. He has a place there in Washington, D.C. It's kind of like a museum, museum, and you see all these statutes of former presidents, etc. And you can go there and you can get a true history of this nation if you visit where uh, Dave Barton has his location there in Washington, D.C. And he also has a website. I think it's the Wall Builder. But anyway, he has all the documents, all the documents from our founding father. And like I said, he knows the history of this nation. And I don't know, he's just a walking encyclopedia and he knows how this nation was founded. So people like that from the different spheres of influence are joining together in what's called a Truth and Liberty Coalition. What they're wanting to do, we envision the reformation of nations by igniting the latent potential in the body of Christ through the seven mountains of influence. So just like the enemy has a strategic plan of how to destroy our nation, we as the body of Christ need to have a strategic plan of how we're going to take back this nation for the kingdom of God. And so I love the fact that now we're trying to do something that will bring together the body of Christ from its different spheres of influence to impact our nation. And like it says on the left-hand side, it's talking about government and law. This is on the website, Truth and Liberty dot net they just uh began this website recently so it's not fully up up and running the way that uh, they intend for it to be when it's all said and done but this lays out the basics and like government and law it says a nation's moral condition is often reflected in its political leaders Unfortunately, we have seen a steady increase of political corruption, as well as a steady erosion of the link between our government and legal system and the Christian values upon which our country was founded. Our ultimate goal for this mountain is put into place righteous political leaders who will bring godly principles into all areas of government. And they've got some links below that and one, the first one is download Trump's accomplishments. What has he accomplished in just the, you know, he's just into his second year, but the economy is really booming for one thing, and there's many things about the economy that it lists. But what it's doing is trying to give us talking points to counteract what the media is having to say about the Trump administration. And we can come back and say, look, this is what Trump has been able to accomplish in just a little over a year that he's been in office. Because if you listen to the media, they don't find anything good 
about our president. They have no respect for him. They belittle him. They mock him. They ridicule him. They put him down. They put him on trial, trying to poke and probe and see if they can find anything that they can get rid of him because they want to impeach him if there's any way possible. And this is why it's so important, the elections, the midterm elections this year is so important is because there are seats up in the Senate and in the, you know, in the Congress that is very important. A lot of times, you know, people are very complacent during midterm election times and the, uh, the president that is in office, his party a lot of times will be diminished by the midterm elections, but we've got to stand strong during the midterm elections because it is so important that the president is just fighting his way uphill trying to uh, turn around our nation. Trump is a businessman. That's why God has him in this position is that he is a businessman and he knows how to deal. He's had deal, uh, financial dealings throughout the world. So he's very acquainted with that. And he has expertise. He knows how to make money. And that's one thing that our country has needed. Plus the immigration situation. He wants to not block those who truly want to come to our country because they love our country and they want to be a part of it. He wants to block those that are coming in and they are criminals or terrorists. He wants to protect and secure us as a people. That's his job. That's the job of the president, really. And yet there are those in Congress who want to block that. So it's very important that we go out to the polls at, in, during the midterm elections and make sure that we keep uh, a solid majority in the Congress so that we can start changing some of the laws that have been made in our country so that we can progress, so that we can be prosperous, so that we can begin to make America great. And as we said before, as goes America, so goes the world. And America has been the leading nation of the world that has supported the gospel throughout the world. And that's why it's so important that we continue. That's one thing that the president values also. He does not want to interfere, interfere with the church. Let the church be the church. Let the church do its job. And he doesn't want to put laws or put restrictions on the church. So that's good things for the body of Christ. So we need to, again, be involved wherever our talents, whatever our gifts are, and whatever expertise that we have, that we need to try to uh, lend our support and our expertise to bring about changes in our entire society because thy kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's what we are called to do. Now, um, Andrew and Lance have made several videos together talking about truth and liberty and what they're trying to do. And Lance appeared on Andrew Womack's Bible, uh, Tuesday night Bible study to talk about this whole concept of what we need to do to transform nations of the world. Because Jesus commissioned us to go into all the world and make disciples. So we have a teaching ministry that we are called to do because a disciple is a student, a learner. So we need to teach them, teach them what God has commanded, what Jesus has commanded us 
that we're to love one another, that we're not to judge one another, that we're to forgive, that we are to give all the things that Jesus has taught us to be servants, to be, you know, to go the extra mile, and the list goes on and on. So we are to teach the nations what Jesus has commanded us. And if we do that, the scripture says that I, beloved, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. It's contingent on our souls, what we think, our mind, our will, and emotions. If our soul is vexed, then we're not healthy. And if our souls are not, uh, if our souls are vexed, then we're not prospering. So God wants us to prosper and be in health, even as our soul prospers. But the soul of this nation. It certainly needs a makeover. We need some help. Excuse me, some help. <clears throat> excuse me. And as I was saying a few minutes ago, the uh, download that was on the truthandliberty.net website, it was talk talking about Donald Trump's accomplishments. These are just talking po uh, points to, co to counter what the media has to say about the Trump administration. And just on the area of economics, you know, the, the, the new tax laws and how that has brought a revival and a, a, a burst of new jobs and expansion as far as businesses is concerned. <clears throat> and also, the creation of 1.7 million new jobs. The unemployment rate is the lowest in 17 years. The stock market has hit record highs 60 times from the time that Trump uh, took office. And also, that the economy has added $6 trillion in worth in just the first year of Trump's administration. $6 trillion dollars that we have made. Instead of increasing our debt, we are decreasing our, our debt. So we're headed in the right direction. We haven't arrived, but at least we have begun. Again, here in Psalm 90, um, I'm sorry, 86 verse 9, it says, all the nations you have made will come and worship before you, Lord. They will bring glory to your name. That's what God wants to see. He wants all nations thriving and prospering and being in health and, and having a, a society that's in harmony and peace, that there's not war, there's not turmoil. So all the nations you have made will come and worship before you, Lord. They will bring glory to your name. When they're doing what God has called them to do as a nation, when America does what God has called us to do, when each country, South America, Canada, Mexico, the UK, when France... Italy, uh, you know, Rome, all these countries, when they are doing what God has called us to do, they will bring glory and honor to the name of the Lord. And this, you know, we see this also in the new heaven and new earth. In the new earth where all the uh, glory of the nations will come before the Lord. Now, in Revelation chapter 2, verses 25 and 26, this is a message to the church. It says, but that which you have already hold fast till I come, that which you have already hold fast till I come. And he that overcomes and keeps my works unto the end, to him I will give power over the nations. Notice that, that God wants to give power power over the nations to the one that has overcome and been faithful and have held fast 
to what they have in the Lord. Here's another way of saying it. I will give power over the nations to everyone who wins the victory and continues to be obedient to me until the end. You will rule over them with an iron rod as when pottery is broken into pieces. This is the same power I receive from my father. I will also give him the morning star. Everyone who has ears, listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. So God wants to give power to the church over the nations of the world. The church should be leading the charge to bring nations to their position in the Lord, that we're to bring glory and honor to God. This is just another way that we see uh, one of the verses, um, how it's translated. We need to aspire to be the overcomers today who will receive authority over the nations and gain Christ. So that should be our aim, our goal, our purpose is to be overcomers that we would receive authority or power over the nations. Because it says, blessed is the people whose God is the Lord. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. When the righteous rule, the people rejoice. When the unrighteous rule, the people mourn. So we need to take our rightful position as we do take our power and authority that the Lord has given to us and go forth into this world and make a difference, change the culture of our nation. And it takes all of us working together to do that in unity. Like I said before, the church is so dysfunctional at this point. And that's the reason why the Lord cannot come back. He's coming for a church that is without blemish, without spot, without wrinkle. He wants the church operating the way that the church should operate. Should operate. We're not to bash. We're not to trash. We're not to put down other believers. We are to work together. And we are to pray. And we are to teach and and to help guide other people in the right direction but not try to tear down each other that's not our job we're not here to tear down one another in the psalms it says how good and how pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity that's what god wants us to be in unity not in compromise of what we believe, but in unity together in our mission and in our purpose. Not tearing one another down, not bashing or trashing one another, but uplifting one another, building one another up, teaching one another, sharing with one another, working with one another. You know, that was the thing about the Tower of Babel, that or Babel, the Tower of Babel that, you know, as long as they were speaking one uh, to one another and they could, could communicate with one another, as they were building, as they wanted to build the tower, God said, if they continue, nothing will be impossible for them because they wanted to exalt themselves above God, really. And... God had to intervene and break up their communication system. But on the day of Pentecost, God gave us a heavenly language, and he says, now I want you to work together in unity. If you will work together in unity and communicate with one another, then nothing will be impossible for you. So we need to work together in love and harmony and peace and unity. And we need to transform this world into the kingdom of God, what he wants it to be. 
Don't wait for Jesus to come back and do it himself. When he's called us and he's entrusted this world to us, you know, in Jesus's parables, he talked about a master and how he gave his servants things or a task to do. And then he went on a long journey and then he came back and he wanted to know what they had done. What have we done while Jesus has been gone? Are we doing our father's business? We talked about this last time. We must be about our father's business. And we need to do it together, working hand in hand with one another in all aspects of our culture. And don't feel like that the only way that we can serve God is through the church or through missions or through missionaries, even though that's a vital part if that's what you've been called to do. But God has given each of us gifts, natural gifts, talents, abilities that are just God-given, things that we're good at. And God wants us to be placed in those positions in order to transform our nation, our culture. We do it in whatever sphere of influence that we happen to be a part of. And so whether it's business or whether it's entertainment or whether it's politics, if God has called us to those positions, then that's where we need to be. You know, I was also listening uh, to Lance and, and Andrew as they were talking about, you know, Trump and how uh, before even Trump was elected that the Lord had revealed to uh, Lance that Trump was going to be the next president. And the Lord had spoken to him, go to Isaiah 45. And so this Isaiah 45 talks about Cyrus, who was a Persian king. And the Jews had been in exile for 70 years until the Persians took over the Babylonians. And the Persian king Cyrus issued a decree that the Jews had his permission to go back to their homeland and start rebuilding their nation and their temple. And he even said, I'll help you do it. Well, I don't have the scripture in front of me, so I'm doing this um, from memory, but it talks about that Cyrus, it was anointed by God. He was a pagan king, He was not Jewish, but God used him to help his nation rebuild itself and to rebuild the temple. And it says about Cyrus, even though he does not know God, he's anointed, but he doesn't know God. And so Andrew and Lance were talking about, you know, Trump would not be our pick. If we were to pick, you know, there were a lot of Christians that were running for the office of presidents um, on the Republican side. But Trump would have not have been our pick out of the mix. But God uses unusual people a lot of times to accomplish his purposes. Like Gideon. Gideon said, I'm the least of the least. Why? You know, the angel came to him and said, hell, you mighty man of valor. And he was hiding in a cave or, you know, he was hiding from the Midianites at that point. But God was telling him, you're going to be the one that is going to go out and you're going to fight the Midianites and you're going to defeat them. And he says, who, me? You know, so sometimes God picks the most unlikely of characters in the Bible to do his bidding, to do what he wants them to do. When Jesus went and prayed and and chose his disciples, who of us would have picked the men that 
Jesus selected. These were fishermen. They were Galilean. They were tax collectors. They were zealots. One was a betrayer. You know, why, you know, if it had been us, would we have selected that group of people? But God wants to use the weak things of these world of the world to confound the wise. That God has a very good sense of humor in who he chooses and who he will use the most unlikely of people to turn this world upside down because that's what it said about the disciples. That was the witness that people said about the disciples. These men who have come here, they're the men that are turning the world upside down because they've been with Jesus. It wasn't because of who they were, but it's who Jesus was in them. And that's what we need to do. That's my prayer is that we will turn this world right side up for Jesus Christ. We've got to do that in our nation. Our nation is critical. It's important. And I believe that God's hand is on our nation. I do not believe that he wants to destroy us. I do not believe that he wants to judge us. I believe that he wants to use us. He wants to use us as a powerful voice to the nations of the world and help transform the nations around us. I've seen, you know, the whole attitude of some of the leaders of other nations and how they are respecting who our president is, even though our media and our politicians, some of them, do not honor or respect our president. There are people around the world that do, and they are glad that we have a president the way that we do. And because we, if we can become great, it will be a source of hope for other nations as well. So we need to stand strong. We need to be about the Father's business. We need to join hand in hand and stop bashing and trashing each other and putting each other down and being, you know, being a, a nation that is divided and hating one another. We need, you know, Jesus said a nation divided against itself cannot stand. So we cannot be... Uh, we cannot continue as a nation unless we are in agreement and working together in unity. So that's my prayer, and that's what I'm trying to emphasize. Let's get together. Let's work together. Let's change. Let's transform this world, and we can do it. We can do it if each of us will do our part. And, Father, I just pray that you... Just put a light of fire in each heart that they would know that they know that this is what you've called them to do, that they are to be a part of transforming this world. Help us to pray. Help us to work. Help us to join together in unity and harmony. You said, ask, and it shall be done for you by my Father. If there's two of you that agree, just ask and it will be done. So let us pray together, let's work together, and let's be together as we make our nation great so that the kingdom of God can come here on this earth. In Jesus' name, amen.